estoy admitiendo a la gente y ahora, eh, ahora sigo con lo del Twitter. Ya estamos transmitiendo en YouTube. Hola, buenos días. Hola, María Inés. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bien, ¿cómo estás tú? Bien, 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 por suerte. Con bastante trabajo, pero muy bien. Como todos. Sí, sí, con estas modalidades que te lleva a otros tiempos. Tenemos eh, a Galaxy Note 20. Si puede poner su nombre y apellido, por favor. Venga. Eh, eh, Colin, eh, good morning, how are you? Uh, good morning, how are you? Fine, fine. I I will change your name and I will put Colin Bellinger. Oh, okay. Sure. Yes. Okay, we will start in two minutes. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good evening for some of you. <clears throat> Welcome to the new session of the online meetings of the Worldwide Energy Network, uh, organized by the University of Talca um, <clears throat> in Perls, Chile. <clears throat> Today, we will have the presentation of Professor Cesar Astudillo with the title, Machine Learning for Renewable Energy, Energies, an Interdisciplinary Perspective. <clears throat> Professor Cesar <clears throat> loves teaching and research, which empowers his academic role at the University of Talca, where he is currently the head of the computer science department. And <clears throat> today we have also uh, two panelists, uh, Professor Yamis Lady Salgueiro and Professor Colin Bellinger. <clears throat> I will give the opportunity to Cesar to introduce uh, their invited panelists, and also I give you the access to share the screen. And <clears throat> after presentation of Professor Cesar Astudillo, uh, I will ask to the panelists to provide some comments regarding his presentation and some questions. And during the presentation, you can uh, put your question in the chat of the Zoom or the YouTube live. 
And after that, we will uh, give those questions to the uh, presenter and the panelists. Okay, Professor, Professor Astudillo, welcome and thank you for being here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, this uh, staying here in, in, in during the pandemic and hopefully we will have a good time and a nice talk uh, of things that uh, are really fun for us. Huh? We, we really enjoy doing this work. So my, my kids right now are in a math exam, so that's why they put me in the backyard. Huh? So I have to use some, some blocker to not be too damaged here at the sun. So um, very well. I will um, have a little talk. Uh, that's that's the, the spirit of this uh, presentation. Just first, uh, a small talk about uh, machine learning and uh, renewable energies. And then uh, we will have a nice conversation with uh, Colin and, and Jamis Lady. Um, we are three people from computer science uh, that uh, have worked uh, in the in this project, particularly in this project in, in electrical engineering, power electronics, but we also have worked in different problems in engineering. So I think uh, we, we can have a really good insights of what does it mean to work in complex problems and how, how do we solve that? How we, we apply artificial intelligence to other fields? So if you are from electrical engineering, that, that's awesome. But if you, if you come from other fields, I think you, you, you can also uh, gain something from this talk. So uh, my name is Cesar Astudillo. I, I'm, uh, uh, as uh, Marco said, uh, I'm professor at the computer science department at the Universidad de Talca. So um, first of all, I want to show you this picture. So this picture is um, it's an example of a complex system and, and uh, it has something very, very interesting because um, uh, known, probably known of the uh, individual musicians, know about uh, the details about the other musicians. So probably they know uh, some lines, uh, they know so if you play the vi violin, perhaps you, you, you can play the viola, but for sure you, you can play one instrument at once, not, not two <laughs> instruments at the same time. So uh, uh, I think th this uh, get a valuable, uh, valuable uh, information of what what does it mean? How, how you build complex things when you only see one dimension of it? So uh, th this is more or less um, what I see happens in, in this uh, example and, and other situations in engineering as well. So many, often people ask me, what is the difference between deep learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning? So I will briefly talk a, a little bit about that. So artificial intelligence is a, a broad topic uh, that involves deep learning and machine learning. So we can say that is the big umbrella uh, for a different uh, sources of uh, uh, developments. Uh, for example, uh, vision, uh, pattern recognition, natural language processing. When you speak with a machine right now, you ask uh, through a website and, and basically a machine uh, uh, answer your questions. So that's part of the artificial intelligence. Uh, also, uh, these uh, drones that are controlled remotely and sometimes uh, intelligently, uh, etc. So uh, this is this is a very broad topic. So then we have one of those topics is machine learning, which is uh, one particular thing that uh, we are going to talk today. And this is about uh, computer science. It's about algorithms, and those algorithms are able to learn from data. So give us data. We put uh, algorithms, programs to work. They feed of the data and build um, models that can say what is going to happen in, in uh, tomorrow. So uh, there are different types of uh, learning. So supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. This is our one of the main branches. There is other types of machine learning as well. But we are in this talk, we are going to be focused here in this place, mostly here. So that means that the data have labels. So we already know what, what to expect these examples, like a baby, when you, you teach a baby, okay, you have a, an apple, an orange, and now a banana. So then I show you uh, some uh, new fruit and, 
and, and the baby uh, can uh, guess what is the new fruit based on what the teacher, the father uh, uh, taught before. So the same thing, uh, same analogy, but with, uh, with data in this, in this case. Um, this is the ad uh, space. So uh, we're organizing an, a conference on pattern recognition uh, at the Universidad de Talca that will take place on March. Um, and is the deadline is uh, November 2nd. So uh, be ready if you are working something interesting in pattern recognition. We are focused uh, in algorithms, but also in, for example, if you have something in the industry that you can show how much you're learning or, or pattern recognition systems apply. Well, welcome to receive your our uh, your paper, and also we will have a special track for students. So, if there is a, a graduate students, undergraduate students working on machine learning, artificial intelligence, please send a paper. It's just five pages. We have Scopus; uh, they're, they're publishing Scopus. So, so uh, please, uh, and also the the it will be very cheap because we'll be uh, mostly online because of this uh, pandemic. So what we have done, we, we have solved problems in air quality. Right now, we're, we're running a project on, on the quality of the, the Maule region. And using machine learning, we have studied right now, we're, we're associated with the, the Universidad Católica to solve problems in the Latin America regarding, we're analyzing data from students of uh, four grade. Uh, we are also working in bioinformatics, uh, looking for proteins, uh, patterns in proteins. And also stock market, we are trying to predict what would happen with the interest rates in, in the Banco Central in Chile, the central bank. And also with, we are working with agronomy. So we have uh, many people, uh, our team is composed of people from uh, graduate students, uh, PhD students, master's master students, undergrad students, pro uh, uh, some professors as well. So. We're, we're getting uh, also this is this is uh, garbage from from the olive uh, so those are olive olive oils and, and and this is this is some some sort of uh, a waste from the oil olive so we're analyzing that as well to uh, this diminish the amount of uh, smell that this this is, goes to the atmosphere so in particular, in this in this talk, I will give some details about uh, one particular work, which is uh, related to um, power electronics, and uh, how this is related to renewable energies. So uh, it's because uh, there is one particular uh, type of circuit, which uh, you know, perhaps you know very well, you're experts in this field. So this is uh, uh, called BSI. So are uh, circuits, a special type of circuits that are um, used for uh, inverting uh, the energy from uh, a current, a direct current to alternate current. Um, so um, this is crucial, it's the device that is crucial for uh, extracting energy from, for, for example, the sun. So what happened here, it, it, there is um, many switches. So if you change these switches, you will have an impact in, in the, uh, these parameters. So there are two parameters that are important. Uh, one parameter is, is the inductance and the other one is uh, resistance. So you, you, you want to know what happened if there is a certain voltage here, and then there is an impact in, the, in, the, in this, those two parameters. So, um, there, there is a bunch of um, devices that you can use to measure uh, what's, what is going to happen. And uh, the good thing of these uh, devices is are, are, um, uh, you, you don't have to inter, uh, interfere what, what is going on in the circuit. So this is uh, some, some specific um, uh, type of uh, settings where you, where you are just uh, not affecting what is going on. So th this is this is a, a particular uh, type of uh, solution that we are uh, offering as well with machine learning. So um, um, Jamie's lady, which is uh, going to talk uh, uh, with us in, a, in the conversation after the talk, she took uh, data from uh, a simulation. So this is this is the the, the, the correct uh, spelling: voltage source inverters. Inverters. So change uh, the current. And uh, uh, we have uh, this, um, this setting, and there is uh, some complicated formulas. I'm sure you're expert on this, all these details. So the, the thing is that you 
go here, apply certain a type of energy to the system, and the system give a feedback. This is uh, uh, this is a feedback of what's going on with the resistance and the inductance. So we uh, start learning the same thing as the analogy with the apples and oranges I gave you it at the beginning of the talk. So we, uh, our oranges and, and, and are these uh, things. So the amount of resistance, the amount of inductance, and also we have uh, some data, let's say the, the, the original input, but we also know certain uh, modifications to the switches in the circuit. So we start to learn what happens if the, if the uh, input is uh, of certain type, what happens if we switch, uh, we change the switch in certain uh, settings and what will happen with the output. So we are trying to learn all this with uh, some sort of technology. So there is many ways to understand this. Uh, you can go to math, you can go to algebra, but in this case, we came uh, to the rescue. So they, they call us and said, okay, we need you to save uh, this problem, solve this problem. So we put ourselves in, in work and I, I select this image because usually when, when someone um, be, um, thinks that uh, there is a computer uh, solution, a program solution, people will think that uh, people sit in the computer and start coding. Well, uh, for that, I, I will say the, 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 this thing. Uh, when you build uh, a building, let's say a 20-floor building, you don't think people just go and mix uh, this uh, stuff to build the building uh, just by magic. No, no. What, what you do is uh, you come up with a plan. You come up with a design. So you, 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 you ask for special people that do this design and think and make a blueprint that will tell you exactly what to do. And after that, you start mixing all the things, the sand and, and, and the stones to build the, 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 the do the construction. So uh, we do uh, that kind of thing. So we build, we come up with a plan. And this plan uh, is a pattern, it's an architecture that uh, we have uh, proved many times in different uh, fields. And, and the idea, I can, I can give you the, the, the general recipe, if you, if you will. This general recipe is uh, start with data. If you don't have data, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do things in our field. So that's the one basic point. So step number one, get the data. We, 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 we do have the data in this case, I, as I will show you. Second step is uh, clean, prepare, manipulate data. So we have to think about the data, understand the data, uh, uh, usually, if we're not experts in the domain, we will ask the, the, the domain experts. In this case, uh, Marco, Jamis Lady know very well about this field. So uh, we ask them what, what happened with these circuits, what means the input, what means the output. And, and based on that, we make a, a plan of how we are going to modify this data. So then it comes the, the model training where we here, here we have these uh, neural networks, deep learning, and all that stuff that you hear in the news and then in YouTube. Uh, so then we test the data because we have to validate that our experiments are, are fine. And, and finally, this is, this is an iterative process. So we check everything and ask to the uh, domain experts if the solutions are satisfactory. Uh, Satisfactory. If not, we modify, revise, understand again, and do this uh, as uh, until we are happy. So, um, in particular, this project uh, comes from a MATLAB simulation. So there was a there were a circuit with uh, I remember three phases a circuit that generate this uh, data. So we have uh, some examples. Uh, we had uh, around 400 examples and we want to know if we, we can uh, get, uh, this is uh, some preliminary results we do, we did, uh, I think um, now, two years from now. Um, so the, 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 the idea is that there were like 400 cases, but 5,000 attributes, 5,000 attributes. This happened because the, the samples were so close that it was, uh, few seconds, but uh, with, a, with a high frequency. So we had uh, 5,000 of this. Uh, think about an Excel file with uh, 5,000 columns and 400 rows. So 
And, and one of these columns was time. So this is uh, called in, 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 in technical ways, this is called uh, a time series. So uh, that was the, the origin of, of the data. And, and then we had this, one of these parameters, the output that was the inductance. Uh, and what's a continuous value? So here we had a uh, first time we had a strong uh, decision. We, we, we had to take a decision. So this uh, has some particular um, properties. So in machine learning, this is treated, uh, this was a, a continuous value and, and this is treated in certain ways. So we, we, we decided to uh, discretize that, this. So we had a very small numbers. You can see this is this is notation, scientific notation for very small numbers. So we changed this to to some very uh, more a convenient manner, a discrete uh, manner. So we 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 put this uh, minus one, minus one if uh, the number of uh, the, the output was in this uh, range, zero if if it was in that range, and then one if uh, that was the situation. So what we, we basically do is to change from a, in, a, in the in mathematical terms what we changed the, the problem we changed from a regression problem which means that we are going to predict a continuous value to uh, uh, some output that was discrete so we change it to uh, in machine learning what is called a um, classification problem so there is a, a wide range of algorithms that solve particularly that problem and when and computationally speaking it has uh, different properties so then uh, here I, I will stop a little bit how is the time uh, 20 minutes uh, you're still uh, awake i think <laughs> okay so um what will happen is that uh, most of my colleagues uh, i think i'm sure uh, colin and james lady will agree most of my colleagues, when they publish a paper, an article on machine learning and solve some uh, interesting thing in engineering, they usually come up with a novel design of an algorithm. So if you check, uh, let's say 20 years from now, uh, I, I don't know, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, 2000 papers in machine learning, uh, perhaps we will have uh, nearly 2000 new algorithms. So we are flooded of new and uh, novel clever ideas and new algorithms. So the, 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 the problem is that we have almost more uh, machine learning problems than problems itself. <laughs> so uh, there is, um, in my experience, I'm, I'm well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm more years <laughs> in this field than I wish. <laughs> so um, uh, what happened is that uh, right now I see things uh, this way. So if I, if I need to design a new algorithm, Okay, uh, I, I do it uh, with a lot of fun because I really enjoy designing algorithms. But uh, in my experience, uh, when there is no need to create a new design, I will check for those in the state of the art and try th those first. So if we need to adapt, then we, we modify. And if we need to create, then we create. So it's like uh, Luis Pasteur. Luis Pasteur uh, inverted the, the vaccine to to uh, cure people, and it was not the opposite. So um, Luis Pasteur didn't invent something and then trying to find someone to inject and in, in, in see if they get uh, in good health. So uh, that, that will be the, my advice because um, I, I, I didn't see that things uh, in this way all the time. <laughs> I learned that from, from the years of work. So um, what we did, we, we chose um, these uh, six or seven different type of algorithms. Those are in any book of machine learning, you can find them. Uh, some of those are very uh, mathematically uh, strong uh, with a mathematical strong background, for example, support back to machines. There are some other that uh, take uh, advantage of uh, some statistics, probabilities, uh, Bayesian probabilities, linear discriminant analysis. This 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 algorithm has almost one one century of uh, age. Uh, so uh, that's it. We have random forest. Uh, we have uh, decision trees, etc. Different technologies, and try to see uh, which one of these uh, will work better. So another issue with this data is uh, those five thousand columns. So five five thousand columns. It's a lot. I don't know if you have worked with Excel, perhaps if you have uh, 30 columns or 50 columns, then you get dizzy. So think about 5,000 columns. So uh, mathematically uh, speaking, this comes with a lot of problems. 
Uh, one particular problem is that uh, when we uh, want to measure the distance between different uh, elements in this space, a file, imagine uh, Descartes. Descartes uh, told you, we learn in, in, in high school how to draw this uh, two-dimensional uh, two plot. So now imagine a 5,000 plot. So it's a, it's a huge space. So and uh, not only we cannot draw that directly, but also if we want to apply functions, mathematical functions, things will not get so smooth. So uh, one usual thing is try to reduce that complexity and come up with something more simple. So uh, these three uh, technologies um, will try to do that, will try to simplify that uh, complexity. So we, we um, check correlations between columns. We apply this, um, if you took, uh, if you come from engineering, so in first year you, you take algebra. So this is uh, some algebra trick. And Boruta, which is a specific algorithm that choose uh, and rank uh, uh, attributes. So this is um, some parameters. I will not stop on this. Uh, this is results. So basically I told you uh, this is random forest, which is a very clever technology. Uh, took, uh, we took very good results. And also uh, we have super vector machines, which is uh, use uh, algebra and hyperplanes to come up with a very clever uh, result. So, uh, oh, this is in Spanish, sorry. So, um, this is something called box plots, and that tells us uh, this is. I, I'd like to see this like a horse uh, race, and these are horses, and this is the beginning, and this is the end. So uh, the horses that goes uh, almost there are the winners. So this we have uh, three winners, and this uh, this is uh, give us statistical information. Let's say the mean, and also uh, certain quartiles, and there's uh, this is this is. Uh, an idea from a statistician called uh, Tuki. So give us uh, a lot of uh, information regarding the distribution. This is, a, this is a summary of 10 executions and we, we see a summary here. So what we will, a good winner is uh, one box plot that is thin and it, it goes very on the top. So close to one. So this one looks good. So random forest has a very good uh, properties. Also, these guys have show good properties. So uh, when we change the type of the dimensionality reduction, when, when we uh, simplify, reduce the dimensions, so things are, um, are more or less similar. So you can see here a uh, linear discriminant analysis and, and also in some other settings, so random forest again goes well. So uh, after that, we have to make a decision. So we learn models and we want to predict the future, in this case, the inductance. And um, based on that, uh, we don't have a, a clear winner, but we have to make decisions. So we, we found that these, um, these um, models, we, we had good results reducing the complexity of, the, of this big uh, spreadsheet, if you want, or matrix. And we um, recommend use random forest in the future with this uh, Boruta uh, attribute selection method. So, but we also know that SVM support vector machines shows good results. So, well, um, for sure, if we, if you want details uh, regarding this, I recommend you to take a look at these two papers. Uh, so here there is uh, people that uh, you will uh, notice in the participants of this uh, this uh, meeting so we this is ongoing work we have a very preliminary work on this uh, presented in a conference uh, two years ago and uh, we have uh, the data was released as well but now where uh, this is I'm so excited to show you this so this is uh, becoming reality and uh, now we will have not only simulations but the and our lab experience we are going to check if our system will work in this situation and for sure we learn a lot and for surely we, we will have to modify what we have originally and come up with something very more realistic and, and hopefully useful. So that's my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Susan Astudillo, for your interesting presentation. I would like to introduce you now, Professor uh, Colin Bellinger. 
is a research scientist in data science for complex systems at the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, and his main area of interest are machine learning, data mining, health, and epidemiology. Uh, we have also invited uh, Professor Yanisley Salgueiro. Uh, he is currently a lecturer at the Science Department at the University of Talca in Curicó. And her main research areas are machine learning, deep learning, multi-objective protection, and smart grids. Uh, I would like to give uh, the microphone to Colin to provide some comments regarding Cesar's uh, presentation. And also, if you have any question for him, you can do that. Colin. Uh, thank you very much, Cesar, for your, your talk. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, and nice to hear about some of the uh, other work that you're doing that I am not involved with, so I don't have actually deep knowledge of it. I, um, I, I will call you soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think uh, rather than providing comments, I'd like to just start with maybe uh, uh, a question and maybe we can talk about it. And that focuses on the last thing that you highlighted and that is these experiments, um, real world experiments and this laboratory experiment. And maybe you can just talk a bit more about the importance of going from simulated data, um, kind of soft data in a computer to actually the real world and testing out these algorithms and seeing how they work in like physical spaces. Yes, so, so in, in, in terms of um, what will happen for an engineering solution, practical engineering solutions, uh, usually we will start with a prototype, uh, something uh, uh, tested in simulated data, synthetic data. But then I learned, especially from these uh, people from electrical engineering, they have very uh, uh, a strong uh, way of doing the research. So they will, they will move to this uh, setting that they built in, in, in labs. So usually that, that is in charge of a PhD student. But then we have another scale, which is actually building the system that it will work in, 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 a, in, in the real world. So, so uh, even though the lab uh, can be thought from the, the, the computer science perspective is much more concrete than just pizza, uh, uh, for them it's an intermediate step. So, uh, and also I have learned that uh, particularly in, in the field of uh, electrical engineering, if they want to, uh, to have a strong uh, article, journal article published, uh, simulated data is not enough for us. For example, we design algorithms. Basically, if we design a clever algorithm, we show that with the simulated data, and, and that will that will uh, uh, be enough sometimes. But uh, for them, uh, it's uh, mandatory to have this uh, sort of uh, verification. So that's why it's, it's, I, I understood that this uh, like a consequence, a, a expected consequence on the development of the project. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm so excited to check this uh, real data, what will happen with our systems and uh, learn a lot how to modify, adapt. And so they, they will, uh, they will um, do some useful stuff. Is this something that you've uh, tried to incorporate into your other research and even your teaching, try to um, share it with your students, the importance of uh, this like moving out of the, the virtual realm? <laughs> Actually, actually, it's very good advice. <laughs> um, well, th this is something that we we should uh, learn and, and adapt for sure. Uh, I think um, uh, right now programs, um, doc uh, doctoral programs, uh, they are much more engineering. I think they they are much more towards innovation and ju not not just a theory. So the the people right now have a spirit of uh, starting a company, and if you do that, uh, theory will not be enough. So you're you're not you 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 will you can learn a lot of books, but but if you don't do concrete things, then it's very difficult to start a company. So mm -hmm. definitely, this is what is needed in the in the next uh, decade. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, lessons that you've learned through uh, this sort of interdisciplinary collaboration or other collaborations that you think have really informed the way that you? Uh, conduct your research? Uh, for sure. I think the first picture, the first picture is uh, one example of that. Uh, I think uh, this, um, well, I, I took, 
I, I chose this uh, picture uh, five minutes before the talk because uh, before that I had a, a picture of my uh, piano teacher, uh, Luisa. Mm -hmm. uh, Luisa told me something very interesting, which is a, a partial knowledge. She said that the only way that people can, uh, let's say, play a piano concert is keeping and, and is keeping the details of the, all the knowledge and trying to uh, feel that gaps uh, in your brain and and I think um, I, no, I never forgot about that lesson because um, when when I work and, and, and talk to clever people that knows uh, they are expert in other fields uh, uh, you, you have to come have a solution that is uh, goes in their fields so you're not expert in that field but you know your own field so this is exactly what happened in the in the philharmonic in 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 the orchestra so people know very well how to play their instruments but they are usually uh, doing something that goes beyond what they know and, and I think that that's the big um, uh, the big lesson of uh, working in this field so how to come up with solutions in education in agronomy in bioinformatics in power electronics being a computer scientist so uh, so that, that's why I, I feel this is an amazing field hmm. yeah I, I, have, I absolutely agree <laughs> So, but um, so so this is uh, sorry, Marcos. Marco, this is this is like um, interaction. Uh, this place is for yes. interaction. Yeah, yeah. So it's I have a good, exactly as we want. Yeah, I have a uh, to have your opinion now, uh, Yami or, or Colin, uh, regarding uh, this uh, thing uh, about uh, working in. Uh, for example, you have worked in different environments with different people, and how is this? How we adapt to work in. In, in, in places where uh, the computer scientist is the minority <laughs> and we have to solve the problems in other fields. Um, Yami, do you want to? Uh... <clears throat> yes. Thank you, for Professor Marco, for the invitation and also Professor Cesar for, uh, for the talk. Indeed, I think that uh, for us, it's a very challenging uh, space or uh, environment because uh, we are not specialists in the energy part but uh, from my experience actually i have a very good experience because i began to work in the Mark, professor marco laboratory and it was a, a very friendly environment and very, very international environment so my adaptation period was really short uh, of course, for us, for a computer scientist, it's, it's challenging uh, trying to understand the application area, which is necessary in order to create or to adapt uh, machine learning models to, to those domains. Um, I have some comments uh, regarding uh, machine learning applications into energy. And one of them is the lack of historical data. Uh, when I tried, when I began to work in this field, I, 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 I could uh, uh, see that that was what the first ch uh, challenge. Uh, Try to find data, uh, historical data, to because if, if we analyze uh, machine learning uh, uh, models, you need a lot of data. And also if we try to apply, for example, uh, modern machine learning, like uh, deep learning, we need a uh, raw and large uh, data. So one of the main challenge in the energy application is the lack of data, the lack of uh, standardized data. Uh, but from the point of view of, uh, from computer scientists, well, uh, a lot of work, a lot of uh, readings, uh, and only, and that was uh, the path to try to understand or try to um, to apply this machine learning model to the energy field. Yes. Uh, Colin, I know that you have worked in some interesting stuff regarding uh, this uh, uh, um, the air uh, pollution in the air in Canada in Ottawa. Uh, can you? Tell us a little bit of that, please. Um, yeah, so I've done um, done some work looking at uh, or looking for associations between um, 
birth outcomes and air pollution. Um, and that was with a large team actually at the University of Alberta. But the data came from across the province of Alberta, also across Canada. Um, and uh, so, so this is uh, an interesting area because it involves computer um, algorithms to try to find these patterns. It involves um, pediatricians, uh, doctors that are specifically interested in, in uh, children uh, and birth and epidemiologists, people that are interested in just generally how uh, chemicals impact uh, humans. So this is a, a, a large inter interdisciplinary team. We had people from uh, the Alberta Hospital Network, people from public health, uh, people from different departments at the University of Alberta. And uh, one of the biggest challenges that we actually found, so as computer scientists, uh, so we, you know, had uh, the, we got the data about five years um, of quite good data uh, about birth outcomes and um, releases from different uh, factories. Uh, so we have the computer scientists, we have uh, a good team of students processing the data, developing and testing different algorithms to find patterns. But at the end, you find these patterns and the people from uh, the application side, the, the doctors and the epidemiologists are like, but how do you actually prove to us that this is, um, this is actually valuable information. Uh, and, and this is something from a, a computer science side we don't often think about. We're often focused highly on, you know, how do we make a better algorithm? How do we get better performance uh, on this data? But the data is just a data set. Um, and we have these metrics that we use. And there's this little, um, I think, disconnect between um, what we do in terms of like from an academic side, battling to develop better algorithms, uh, better accuracy, better sensitivity, uh, and what people that are actually trying to solve these problems in the real world are doing and how they validate them. And this was the biggest, um, this was by far the biggest uh, struggle. I think that we had to come up with a common way to understand uh, what is the meaning of this. In medicine, uh, there's very well um, thought out and ingrained practices about how you understand whether a result is meaningful or not, and those do not match with what we do. Um, and so trying to build trust uh, was really a, a significant problem. And I think that this uh, spans not just medicine, um, but all areas. And we see this um, with the with building of the lab, right? Uh, the laboratory experiments to test the electronic circuitry. Um, we can't just take algorithms and show accuracy or, or sensitivity area under the rock curve in order to prove the worth of the algorithms we there's there's a next step that we often miss and trying to understand what that step is is sometimes very difficult um, and that's this is one of the biggest challenges that, uh, mm -hmm. that i've experienced just uh, as a joke i, I think uh, uh, during the 70s and the 80s uh, computer scientists were focused on understand how the computers work but I think now the big issue is to try to understand uh, how to communicate to people. So if, if we're uh, uh, in like in four wa uh, walls, we cannot solve real issues and we are only will succeed now if we go, go outside the world and talk to people, solve real problems. So uh, interdisciplinary research is about that. And it's about uh, trying to understand a common um, uh, common uh, words, common concepts to uh, learn enough to solve a problem, but understand that the other guy is expert and, and you will not have all the details uh, that they have in their domain because you don't have enough time. So mm -hmm. um, I, I completely agree with what the, you two are saying. So from, from different uh, fields. So um, Jamie, you, you also have uh, some experience in the, this, um, multiple optimization problems. So how do you see they arise in, in electrical engineering? You mean the application of uh, multi-object optimization? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, <clears throat> nowadays we, we try to optimize almost everything because we have usually uh, low resources. And energy is a, a big application area where we can apply a lot of uh, optimization methods. Uh, once again, I think I agree with, with you that the uh, multidisciplinary and, inter and interdisciplinary uh, teams are needed in order to 
provide a holistic solution for, for those problems. Not only focus, uh, because sometimes we think that uh, machine learning is the most important part in, in one energy, so in one energy solution, but it's only one component of the whole system. So uh, the same is with uh, multi objective optimization. Uh, the algorithms is one component of the whole system. Uh, so you, you also need uh, data sensors, you also need internet, you also need cloud uh, infrastructure to in order to process all the information. So yes, uh, I agree with you. It's important, relevant. And, and, and guys, I have a question for you too. Um, I have talked to clever people in, in the electrical field and they say, okay, yes, I know about the, I have this electrical circuit. I know about the neural networks. We have applied, we have made a MATLAB code to make a, this, uh, learn this data. So the, the, the thing is the message, what's, what's your opinion? What, when uh, they can solve the problems by itself and when um, um, a machine learning uh, specialist is needed? I think, like in, for example, in a surgical team, you need a specialist in each field in order to get, to try the patient to, to be alive after the, a, a, surgery, a surgical procedure. Uh, in science, it's the same. Uh, you need a, a specialist in each of the fields in order to uh, create, as I mentioned, a holistic solution. Because I read many papers where uh, specialists in power electronics use the, the FAUS uh, setting of a machine learning model in order to solve, solve one problem. But when you see the, the solution, you don't exploit the, the, the model uh, capabilities in, the, in, in full. You only use uh, in a small portion, a small capability of that model in order to solve a problem. And that, that is one of the main reason, reasons uh, behind the, 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 sometime, the problem that sometimes the solution don't fulfill the expectation of the, of the persons and mostly in uh, real world applications. So in my opinion, uh, as in a surgical team or a medical team, you need a specialist of each field also in energy, you need a specialist of, of each uh, field, of, if, of, of each area. And of course, uh, machine learning and data scientists are, are that specialist. Machine learning uh, or computer science professor. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Gami, <clears throat> Colin, Cesa, for, for the interesting discussion. Uh, we have some comments and also some questions from the participants. Um, I would like to ask to, uh, them to, to you. Uh, there is a comment uh, from our YouTube live, Luis Cordero. He said that academy and industry should work hand in hand. That way data becomes available to research. Unfortunately, data seems unavailable for energy research, but for those who work in the industry and most of time data are not public. So this is a, a comment from him, but also is a, I think that is an issue for this kind of research. Uh, what can you comment regarding this? Professor Yami Colin. Yes, indeed. The, the performance of modern machine learning uh, for example, deep learning is driven by, by the interaction of two processes. The increased availability of data and the ability to train large model with a lot of data. As you mentioned, uh, one challenge within the energy ap application domain is the lack of, of that data or the lack of access to that data. So, uh, and also, of course, the uh, the concerns regarding the, the, the privacy of the people who provide or who generate those data. I think that eventually uh, a compromise solution should rise where we can, uh, as scientists, get access to those data. And also the, the industry uh, allowed us to, to or give us that, that, that access 
so we can uh, improve or we can generate uh, models or more uh, robust models uh, to, to those data. But of course, we need data to, to, to train, to, to test, to, to, uh, to create new models. We need data. Mm. OK. So, sir? Yes, I, I can, I think, um, give an insight in two, in two levels. Uh, the first level is engineering, and the second level is uh, science in general. So in, 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 from engineering perspective, uh, it's totally understable because uh, companies, they, uh, their data is their gold right now. And if you don't share the gold, it's usually empires or countries, they don't share the gold with other countries. They preserve the gold. So in, 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 that, in that way, uh, it's totally understandable that companies will want will want to put uh, the, all the data in, into a safe. So they exploit the data, they understand, and they take better decisions with the data. So this is a, 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 in the opposite side. <laughs> uh, we have science where uh, data in a safe uh, is a big problem. And this is because of uh, some uh, the scientific method the scientific method has one thing that is very important, which is reproducibility. So when, when someone said, okay, I did something and I, I published this and I explained to the humanity how I did this, a one is a basically a, a basic step is that some other researcher take this and try to replicate that. The problem is that we, if we don't have the data, then we, we can't replicate exactly what is done. So how, how can we do that? So then we go to the method. Okay, we, 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 make, we follow the method and try to do something that is uh, more or less the same. So, so then data comes a, a, a very crucial thing into the, into the science. So, uh, so how do we live? How do we live? How do we develop companies and, and, and take value of the data and, and privacy concerns? And then how do we develop science and expose that data? So I think then, we will have uh, different solutions, whether engineers go work with a company and they will have to accept that they have uh, secrets. Uh, the data is something secret. It is part of the value of the company. But then if you move to academy, then you will have to expose this data. And it's, it's not, um, if you publish some paper, you have some ethic concerns regarding uh, uh, publishing the data. So some other people can test uh, exactly what uh, can replicate what you have done. I think that another in, uh, important component in what you mentioned, Cesar, is the definition of a standard. Uh, we, we can see within the energy application that, that some we lack of uh, a standardized uh, data. So, of course, you spend a lot of time trying to uh, create those data to those raw data because they are in different uh, standards. So, I think that one step uh, forward to, uh, to that uh, availability of data is also the establishment of uh, standards. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, uh, Cesar and Jan. <clears throat> there is a, a question from Camilo Gonzalez. Uh, this is more related to power electronics. In the two-level voltage source inverter, the VSI, the output voltage of the inverter had seven possible switching vectors. The world of finding the best switching vector is very important for some control algorithms like priority control. And this pattern recognition techniques can be implemented in multi-level converters with more combinations on switches? Yes, yes, it can be applied. Of course, you will need to uh, generate data and train the models with, with the data generated by, uh, by that uh, multilevel voltage source inverter, but this uh, fully applicable. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> there is another comment from Paulo Espinosa uh, to Cesar. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, I didn't know. Boruka, it seems good to me for the engineering of feature also that with the random forest, it gets good results. So uh, can you give more comment regarding Boruka techniques? 
Yes, um, well, there, there is a... Monitor, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah. thank you very much uh, for your comment. Um, and um, Boruta is uh, one algorithm from a list of uh, some other algorithms. So there is uh, dozens of algorithms for selecting attributes. So basically what is, what is the property of this algorithm in particular is that instead, if we have a big dimensional space, let's say 5,000 dimensions, we have basically, if you, we want to simplify that, we have basically two options. One option is to pick, let's say we have a big Excel file. So we, we zip the Excel and have some small Excel, which is a combination of everything that was there. So we try to, to crunch all this, or we have, uh, the, 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 the columns and we show certain columns. So those are the two big families in the, in the, attribute, in the dimensionally reduction techniques. So Boruta belongs to the second one. So uh, it selects certain attributes instead of uh, trying to compress everything. And apart from that, uh, this is a special algorithm that not only selects the algorithms, but also gives you a score. So it tells you uh, how much one particular attribute is contributed to the, um, to the uh, uh, original, uh, the prediction of uh, some certain target variable. So th this, is, um, this is an algorithm coming from uh, machine learning uh, domain. Um, and it's gaining a lot of attention because uh, actually in our group, this uh, method uh, gave us very good results in, uh, with biological data. But we didn't know if it did was working good uh, with uh, electrical uh, data. Uh, it happens that it was um, it was good. So this is part of the right now. I think it's part of the the things that we are choosing. Uh, uh, right now, it's, it's novel. Let's say we we found that this algorithm is is uh, interesting. We have potential in this field. So we uh, probably in in the next experiments that we are going to do with uh, power electronic data. We will try this algorithm because it's uh, giving us a good uh, solutions. But uh, this is something that we didn't know in advance. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a question for Colin. Uh, in some areas, I have listened the overfitting term, for example, in convolution and neural network. It is a common issue in this area, or it is something that can be avoided? Um, it's, yes, this is a common, overfitting is a common issue throughout uh, machine learning, uh, and it's something that you have to be uh, aware of for all algorithms, um, but some algorithms are more susceptible to overfitting uh, than others, and particularly deep neural networks are highly susceptible to overfitting, and this is one of the reasons why um, when you're when you're applying machine learning to um, a specific application, you ought, you need to have uh, interdis interdisciplinary expertise and people that really understand these algorithms because now it's becoming more and more uh, straightforward to apply deep learning algorithms to any problem. Uh, and constantly, I'm sure it's the same uh, everywhere. It's it's certainly the case in Canada that we are constantly hearing in the media, media the sort of the, the power of these deep neural networks and the ability for them to stall, solve almost any problem. And so now people are trying them on all these problems. But if you take, uh, for example, the situation that Cesar presented where we had uh, 500 features uh, and only a relatively small number of um, examples, uh, this is a case where overfitting is a, is a huge risk. and. Um, um, feature selection is one way to help avoid that, uh, but there are other other techniques, especially in neural networks related to regularization. Um, you can add a bit of noise to your data. Uh, you can use dropout in in your hidden layers, uh, and also you can change your optimization function in order to uh, try to avoid overfitting. Um, but it's something that you really have to be aware of all all of the time. You can test your model. Um, fairly sim simply uh, by looking at its performance during training, its performance on a validation set, and then its performance on an independent test set. And look at how those training curves um, um, change. Uh, if your data is overfitting, you'll find that you have, um, your model converges to no or nearly no error uh, on the training set, does quite well in the validation set, but then when you apply it to your test set, you'll see that you have much higher error. So you 
your data has, uh, or your model has overfit your data. What this means is it's learning uh, very unique features or properties within your training set. And it's more or less memorizing these, but these don't generalize across the population of your data. Uh, and so when you apply it, it's, it's actually making mistakes. Um, and so yeah, this is a, this is a huge area of importance. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Colin. Uh, there is another question uh, from Carlos Pimentel from all of you. Uh, and he asked is, do you have some examples of using artificial intelligence in power system operations? Chami, perhaps you have- Yes, <clears throat> operation, well, uh, one of the application is related uh, to the one presented by Professor Cesar and is the prediction of certain uh, parameters like uh, resistance and inductance and also the, uh, the for the maintenance for the predictive uh, maintenance of power converters in order to to uh, establish if the converter is working properly and also try to uh, to to uh, to, man, to, to give uh, predictive maintenance to the power converter. Yes. Mm. But mostly those are the, the main applications to predict some parameters uh, that later will be used in the power converter control and also mm -hmm. to establish if the power converter is uh, working properly. And how, how do you see the prospects uh, for the use of artificial intelligence algorithms applied to predictive maintenance for solar photovoltaic energy plants? Have you evaluated this uh, situation? Yes, it's also well, when you have a, a big uh, uh, array of uh, energy panels, you need to establish uh, which is uh, well, the, you need to establish uh, if the panels are working properly. So of course you can apply also uh, machine learning models in order to establish if they need to be uh, replaced or if they need to be clean. So just also the application of uh, machine learning uh, models is, uh, is viable into the uh, uh, energy power converters and uh, the array of photovoltaic uh, panels. Yes. <clears throat> okay. I, I want you. to complement. I want to complement the answer. I remember that uh, with the colleagues the other day, I was in the mechanical engineering uh, uh, workshop. In the in the where there were uh, like building some sort of uh, device for cleaning um, these uh, panels. Uh, was an invention of um, a colleague in, in the Faculty of Engineering here at Udatka. So um, I think uh, your question is uh, very interesting and, and I was related to relating to this uh, machine, this robot. And actually, um, as, as we said at the beginning, um, it, for machine learning, we need data. So the, the, the different sorts of data can, uh, for example, as Jami said, we can have uh, information about the, the how well the energy is, cap is, is uh, being uh, captured by the panels. If they go down, perhaps it's because it needs uh, maintenance. For some reason, it's not operating very well. But uh, we have some other sorts of data. For, I, I'm thinking about this robot, for example. We can we can see we can check with sensors uh, if this robot is uh, getting good good information if, if the panel is clean if there is a lot of dust of of, uh, of of perhaps it did it doesn't need it doesn't need uh, cleaning so then I'm wasting my time through in the robot there I'm wasting energy so perhaps it's not just a matter of when to to if, if it is needed but perhaps not doing anything is also a good a good solution. So uh, I think that the, 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 as, as many of the engineering applications, uh, machine learning has uh, solutions if we have the data and is only limited by the imagination of the, of the engineers. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I'm gonna just add one uh, point. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the the other thing that we're well, the one thing that we're somewhat missing in in this realm of um, of prediction is is good interpret interpretability. Um, and so Cesar's point is actually a very good one, where may, maybe our algorithm says uh, that you know the the panel is producing less uh, energy than. Uh, than it has in the past, or it seems to be misbehaving. Uh, but if, if the engineers that actually work on these problems and sort of solve them, debug them, can't actually take from the algorithm information about why or what it's doing to trigger this alarm, then uh, it's very hard to um, move forward with. So this is an area that we actually need to work more on is the interpretability of the predictions of the algorithms. Uh, I, I want to go okay. I, I want to compliment. <laughs> Please, uh, interpretabil interpretability right now is a big issue in machine learning. And, and this is because of a basic uh, uh, concept. Uh, right now, we're blindly tr uh, uh, trusting what the machine is, is saying. So we have a very complex deep learning. And this, uh, that person said, OK, you have a cancer tumor. So it's very bad. So you have to do this exam. But um, uh, let's say if we just, uh, this is work a black box, so the machine is not telling us why the machine thinks that. So sometimes machines make mistakes and we want to be sure that it's not a mistake and we want to know the reason why the machine is taking uh, that decision. So I think if for the, perhaps the next uh, 10 years, we will be very focused on developing specific algorithms. Actually, I'm supervising a PhD thesis on that topic. So how can we do accurate models to explain in human beings what is going on on the machines? <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. Um, I have one question, uh, especially for Cesar and Jamie. Uh, because you mentioned during your presentation that you are working in the experimental part, implementing this idea and try to obtain the, the data. Uh, but I'm wondering if you have to do a lot of computation, a lot of calculation, uh, how, how will you do that? Uh, what do you think will be the challenge for, 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 for this kind of implementation and test? You mean if, if we try to uh, implement uh, machine learning solutions within a voltage source inverter with yes. 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 Uh, well, you have um, you have to well, of course one thing is when you try to train the model and when you try to test uh, the model and the other thing is when you uh, use that model to make predictions in real life. Uh, usually the training phase is uh, computational expensive. So that's one of the reason that you need a, a lot of computational resource. But most of these uh, machine learning models are, uh, are for, uh, matrix uh, transformations. You can that knowledge, for example, if you are using a, a, a neural network, you, you at the end, the knowledge, once the model was uh, training is within a, a, a matrix. So the prediction uh, transform into ma ma matrix, ve matrix uh, vector multiplication. So uh, one solution is, uh, of course, uh, one thing is train the models and the other is using in real life applications. So as I mentioned in real life application, the time is, is, uh, is less. Uh, but also you can use uh, asynchronous uh, actions uh, in the power uh, converter in order to uh, try to, make, to have an impact or try to have an action uh, based on a model prediction uh, state. So those, uh, are the, the, the ways where you can uh, uh, apply the uh, models, uh, machine learning models within a voltage or uh, within a converter, power converter. Uh, okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for your comments. <clears throat> uh, we don't have more questions from the participants. So um, in order to close this session, I would like to uh, give the chance to Colin and Yami and Cesar 
to provide your final words and comments. Uh, uh, so, Yanni, can you start later, Colin, and finish with Cesar? Yes, once again, thank you, Marco, for the invitation and Professor Cesar for his, his talk. Uh, well, I want to, to highlight once again the importance to have a computer scientist within a research team, uh, not only in energy application, but in every application that you try to do. It's relevant to have a multidisciplinary team in order to create holistic solutions to energy or to whatever we want to, to apply artificial intelligence. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Colin? Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Marco and uh, Cesar, for the invitation to participate. It's been uh, great uh, seeing and chatting with everybody. Um, I guess my, my final thought is uh, just to re-emphasize the importance of working uh, closely together. Um, from the application side, I think uh, whether it's industrial applications or other scientific uh, applications. It's absolutely critical that, that the owners of the data think uh, well into the future about what they might want to, to do with the data uh, in order to ensure that it's um, stored and, and recorded in a format that will allow us to work successfully together um, and that we work um, closely between disciplines in order to build a common understanding of what it is that uh, AI can achieve uh, and what it is that um, the application in mind uh, really needs in order to actually get to the, the goal that we're looking to, to get to. Um, so thanks again. Mm, thank you, Colin. That's yeah, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of uh, talking about this uh, concept, which is uh, very interesting for us. Uh, it's very fun to us. And uh, my final thought is about uh, complex uh, problems. So the, the idea is that no matter how smart you are, if you are solving complex problems, uh, you will not be uh, enough for solving those problems. And this is common in many fields in engineering. So we need to uh, work as a team and understand uh, the strong points of everyone and the weak points of everyone, but try to fill the gaps with the whole teams, team and to come up with a, with a complex solution. And, and also artificial intelligence can do amazing, amazing things. If we, uh, and that's why it's, going, uh, it's being spread in so many uh, domains in engineering and uh, some other fields. So um, that's it. I, I'm very excited to work in this field because I, I, I think that I'm living in the center of the, all the development of science and engineering right now. So thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Cesar, Colin, and Yami for, for this interesting discussion. I really enjoyed uh, all the comments given by you and the presentation, and for sure the audience as well. <clears throat> uh, there are some comments in the chat that you can check if you want. And uh, with this, we are closing this session. And we kindly invite you for the next session that will be in October 20. This presentation will be in Spanish. And in the next days, we will send you the invitation with more information. OK, so thank you very much. And keep in touch. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar, Yami.